Awesome. I think that's all set up. Um, I will let one or two more people make their way in. Neat. Um, so thanks for joining us, everyone. This afternoon, we have um, Harman Madan. Is that how I say your name? Yes, it's Madan. Oh, That's sorry. Very, very close to pronouncing it the right way. Thank you. <laughs> and he's joining us from India, where it's probably a bit early right now. So thanks for joining us. Um, talking about circular economies, I chatted with one of his colleagues a few weeks ago, um, and it sounded like a really interesting topic, um, and hopefully something that's that's useful for part of our course. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Madam, and hello to all of you. Just so that I have a little context, uh, I know we're not too many of us in here, but if I could get just a quick overview of the class and well, what each of you is looking to get out of this call, then it would probably help me speak to it a little better. Yeah, cool. Do you want people to, so there are about 10 of us in the classroom here, and then it looks like about 10 people on Zoom. Um, do you want people to to pop it into the chat or a quick going around the room? I could pass a microphone around. Into the chat would be fine. Otherwise, we'd use up a lot of time. Yeah, cool. So if, if people in the chat want to pop in. Um, yeah, and that's not really something we've talked about, what you're wanting to get out of this course. Um, Anyone in the room wanna wanna throw an answer out? I can pass the mic around. It's a bit easier when you get to type it into a chat and be a bit more anonymous. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah. Anyone have anything to add? Yeah. Um, and I did watch your your talk on from the Auckland, from that um, conference that was recorded. And I guess I just just learning about it was really useful about the term circular economy. I guess I hadn't known about that before, but then how it can relate to New Zealand specifically and how it relates to climate change. Yes. Oh, cool, yeah. Awesome. And we had one person in class say that they're especially interested in what the challenges of implementing a circular economy are and who's taking on those challenges. Fantastic. In fact, that's what we start with. Cool. Oh, we've got one in the chat. Um, personal interest and overview of climate change. So hopefully that helps you to start. Um, is that all good? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. We'll let you go then. Yeah. And I love this for this to flow organically. So please, at any point in time, while I'm presenting, if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. And I'll try and address it at that time, or else we can hold on and conclude all the questions uh, later. But let's just keep it organic. And uh, so I'll start with, yes, a focused overview of climate change. That's ac actually a very good starting point. As we all know, climate change is related to global warming, as we would refer to it earlier. And this is a consequence of the amount of heat that ends up being trapped in the Earth's atmosphere, which in turn is a consequence of fossil fuel use. And now why is this? Here we need to make the distinction between fossil carbon, which is the carbon that we utilize from fossil fuels, such as coal and oil, and biogenic carbon, which is what is produced by uh, the biosphere, by all living things. Now, biogenic carbon goes through an infinite cycle, right? We're all familiar with the principles of photosynthesis, the creation of glucose, glucose being the basic energy that all living things require, and the food chain. So this carbon goes through an infinite uh, cycle, it's recycled countless times and has been for millennia. The problem occurs when or has begun to occur when humans have discovered fossil fuel use and our over-dependence on fossil fuels and the way our energy systems are designed today. So in the context of the climate change 
conversations that we're beginning to have now, we've started recognizing that there are emissions as a consequence of all human activity or anthropogenic activity, which of course have some unintended consequences as we're all beginning to learn. So the challenges, which are also what I would like to call the enablers for us today, let's start with that, revolve around the three pillars of technology, policy, and finance. So from the technology perspective, we need a solution that is resilient, that's multi-utility, and uh, will last. So it has to be perennial and sustainable in that sense. Obviously, we need to have the right kind of financial instruments, because unless there is commercial viability, it will not happen. We cannot expect people to act out of good faith. The right financial incentives are necessary. And these financial incentives would, of course, come about as a consequence of having the right or the appropriate policy framework. And that's where we see out here or New Zealand begin to demonstrate to the world the right kind of policy initiatives. Yes, there are some challenges currently specific to New Zealand, but they are changing. So, in fact, there's a fresh water bill that looks at the amount of nitrates in water, which is a direct consequence of uh, agricultural policies. There's also a three waters reform program, and there is an emissions trading scheme with, in fact, the price of a New Zealand unit of carbon already being listed on the New Zealand uh, Stock Exchange. So these are the kind of policy level levers that are coming about. Right. So our focus has been primarily on the areas of waste management and trying to create a circular system whereby we manage our waste in a more sensitive manner and recover resources from it. These resources are primarily in the form of energy and nutrients. But before we get into that, this is just a quick overview of what our current waste management systems are. So starting from the left, that's a sludge pond somewhere in the Lakes District on the South Island. These are sludge ponds where essentially all our waste goes and ends up uh, where it dries out. That's one option that we have for managing our waste. <clears throat> Sometimes we utilize mechanical systems that use heat or solar energy to dry out sludge. And then ultimately we send it to a landfill or we discharge it directly into waterways. And this is a problem <clears throat> for obvious reasons. It's not only is it unsightly, but it's not good for the environment or the local ecology. And it's definitely detrimental to public health. And when we look at uh, wastewater and waste emissions in general, what we've begun to see in the New Zealand context, of course, this is a breakdown between scope one, two, and three emissions. So scope one emissions are the emissions that are directly related to the production or the release of greenhouse gases by that process. The scope two emissions are obviously uh, a consequence of the energy use by a utility and how this energy has been derived. So there's obviously an emissions factor associated with the production and transmission of uh, energy or electricity as we understand it. And lastly, of course, there are scope three emissions which are associated with the final disposal of a residue or an end product. So this is what we see in the New Zealand context. And obviously the largest proportion of emissions uh, <clears throat> come from methane, from waste, and to an extent nitrous oxide as well. I'll just quickly skip through the next few slides. This talks a little bit about New Zealand's energy use by fuel type. And uh, here, of course, there is a belief, a well-held, long-held belief in, in New Zealand that the bulk of energy generation in New Zealand is renewable. And that is partly correct. New Zealand has a significant degree of installed hydropower, 
but uh, it does not necessarily have a complete utilization. So the install capacity and the actual generation, there is a difference in that. Further, in months where or in years where there isn't adequate rainfall and the hydroelectric reservoirs don't have enough uh, water, the only way to manage the demand gap is to utilize more coal. So in 2020, for example, in the midst of the pandemic, New Zealand imported over a million tons of coal from Australia and Indonesia. So that's one thing to be mindful of. Secondly, what we see is that New Zealand still has a very, very significant dependency on oil, which it imports for its transport use. Process heat requirements are still largely met by coal. And this is, uh, when I say process heat, this is energy that's required in the primary industry, largely for the processing and packaging of, uh, or the drying out of milk solids, meat packing plants, etc. The expectation is that gradually New Zealand will use less coal and begin to rely more on biomass uh, or wood. And this is considered to be a renewable fuel because you can always have planted forests that grow and absorb carbon from the atmosphere. And again, so this is an example of moving away from fossil carbon to uh, biogenic carbon and thereby creating a bioenergy market. The other factor obviously is, or the big elephant in the room in the context of COP26 obviously has been the emissions associated with agriculture. And in New Zealand, that's particularly true for methane emissions, which are a direct consequence of the vast quantities of dairy farming across both the North and South Islands. And methane, as per the last uh, assessment report of uh, the United Nations, it's considered to have uh, a global warming potential 26 to 28 times that of carbon dioxide. So. And as you can imagine, if there is a significant quantity of, being, of methane being produced every single day by a large uh, livestock population, then this is definitely a problem. However, and that's where we recognize that with all these challenges, if we apply first principles, of, you know, scientific first principles, engineering first principles, we can actually design a system whereby these so-called biogenic emissions begin to present themselves as an opportunity and can actually be utilized as a fuel source. Of course, we have to recognize the cascade of production. So it has to follow a food, feed, fiber, and fuel hierarchy. Right, so quite simply, food is what you and I eat. Feed is what we feed our livestock. Fiber is what we utilize for you know, producing products such as fibers for our clothing. And then lastly, look at fuel use. So this is one of the things that we believe is the right way forward, particularly for a, for a country like New Zealand, which has a large agricultural baseline and a very strong primary industry. And here we begin to see that the energy potential in terms of just the biogas yield from the waste currently in New Zealand is uh, in excess of 10% of New Zealand's current energy needs. And recognize that this is purely from waste. We're not even talking about what would happen hypothetically in a not too distant future if we begin to transition New Zealand agriculture away from livestock and more towards energy crops. So this is just, again, a little bit, a little more data. This is, these are data sets that we have from the likes of Becca, which is a large engineering consultancy, and Scion, which is a Crown Research Institute. These are the people who we work with very closely. The other factor that we need to recognize is in the context of climate change, there is also a critical need for us to manage our water resources, right? And until we begin to do that, we will struggle 
to meet our commitments. The fact of the matter remains is that there can be no life without water, right? So as an aside, just to highlight this fact, when we talk about colonizing Mars, for example, and we search for evidence of life, what we look for is traces of, of water or water vapor. <clears throat> and we're all very excited to know that space probes to Mars have, have proven that there has been at some point in time in the past millennia water on Mars. But without water, we cannot have any life on Earth. <clears throat> and this is where having a more ecologically sensitive approach is important. And this is why we need to treat water and our natural environment in, uh, in a more sensitive manner. And this is where we see that the existing processes and systems that exist in the natural world can actually provide us the clues about how we treat our waste, right? And so that's what this slide is about. I won't get into too much detail here. I'll save it for some questions. But I'll pause and ask, does anyone have any questions so far? Or shall I just continue? Oh, we do have a question. Sorry, we muted ourselves. Uh, what's your question? <laughs> Oh, cool. There's a question about how biogenic fuel would be harvested um, and how it's done ethically. Is that it? Yeah. Again, an excellent question. And uh, I'll speak to the how is it harvested part before I get into, oh, sorry, the ethical part. As long as we follow the cascade that, that I spoke about, which is we ensure we focus on food, feed, and fiber before having the use for fuel, then that does begin to answer the question around ethics. In terms of how is it harvested? Well, uh, there are a number of food grade, or I won't say food grade, but a number of crops that can serve the purpose both for food and energy. Of course, current market mechanisms can skew that picture so that's a very good and a very pointed question we've seen that particularly with corn or maize uh, and largely in northern uh, north central america where there have been skewed subsidies for ethanol production from corn and what happens is either the price of corn goes very high and in subsequent harvest years it's not so high and then we end up burning excess uh, corn. So that's one example of where the demand supply gap is tried to be met through market mechanisms that are not necessarily aligned with the energy system in a given geography. However, for New Zealand, that shouldn't be as much of a challenge because of uh, New Zealand's relative geographic isolation and the fact that systems currently are already well advanced in terms of managing production and recognizing what the energy demand is. Does that answer your question? Do you have a follow-on question to that? No, that was great. Thanks so much. We'll let you, I don't think there are any other questions here, so thanks. Okay, so now we'll come through to trying to make a distinction between a linear model and a circular model. And as we know, our current economic systems are largely a linear model. So it's about extract, it's consume, it's dispose. And this is where we begin to find the challenges around how we live. Whereas a circular model, and particularly what we're trying to do today, I'll talk about today, is about recognizing that what we use and what we consume 
we have to be mindful of our consumption, mindful of our production, and create a system which has little to no waste. And in fact, the processes or the byproducts of a given process should feed into the next. And that's what we mean by a circular economy or a circular model. So this is, of course, just a pictorial representation of what we mean or what I was speaking about earlier. And this now brings us absolutely to what it is that Elementary Systems does. That's the company that I founded in New Zealand with my partner, who Lauren had spoken with uh, a couple of weeks ago. So Elementary Systems is a company that designs, installs, and commissions integrated waste treatment plants. And when we say integrated waste treatment plants, these are by their nature plants that treat any and all forms of organic waste, including sewage, sludge, uh, slaughterhouse waste, green waste, any form of organic waste, which otherwise is disposed of in landfill or left in open windrow composting units is processed. And the energy is recovered to not just run that process itself, but at scale, even supply energy where required to <clears throat> to the local environment and the point of this entire system is obviously to reduce the scope one two and three emissions to create uh, more energy efficiency to have a resilience and ultimately also as a byproduct of this process create a stabilized pathogen free organic fertilizer which then is used in agriculture and substitutes chemical fertilizer. So what very few of us may be aware of is that our agriculture causes a lot of greenhouse emissions and not just from uh, dairying or livestock farming, but in fact, in the creation of uh, synthetic fertilizers. So <clears throat> we need to produce, or we believe we need to produce chemical fertilizers in order to meet our food and feed requirements. And we do this with extremely energy intensive processes, which ultimately rely on fossil fuels. And we use, believe it or not, natural gas, which is largely methane, as the primary feedstock for the chemical process of synthesizing chemical nutrients. And we mine phosphates. And the world is already achieving peak phosphate. Phosphate is, uh, or phosphorus is one of the primary nutrients used in agriculture. And we are expected to reach peak phosphorus in 2026, I believe, is, is what the last uh, update was. And for New Zealand, particularly, all of the phosphorus that New Zealand agriculture utilizes comes from the Western Sahara. And uh, there are human rights activists who refer to that as blood phosphate because it's phosphate that is mined without the consent of locals. But that's a whole separate political argument that we won't get into. But <clears throat> the point is, all living beings, or I'll be more specific, mammals, so humans, livestock, they produce, uh, and even birds for that matter, produce urea and phosphorus in their waste, in their bio waste. And these are naturally occurring, naturally synthesized, and can be reutilized in agriculture, obviously provided it's processed in a scientific manner, in a hygienic manner. So that's why we see that when we move from a linear system and extractive model to one that recognizes that what we consume and what we produce and what we excrete also has value, that's when we begin to see a, a, a you know, more natural system coming into effect. This is uh, what we're beginning to see now, is that our current industrial processes are designed in a way that will, the inevitability that we will produce a lot of waste. There will be waste, waste byproducts, there will be waste energy. And 
we don't think about it, right? Our disposal culture is something that we've become accustomed to. <clears throat> so we buy milk in cartons, we have disposable pens, disposable uh, shaving razors, things that are everyday products that we stop thinking about. We buy food in disposable containers, our food from the supermarket comes wrapped in cling wrap. It, these are just examples, very obvious everyday examples of how we stop recognizing that this is uh, causing a problem for us and other species on this planet. And of course, one of the consequences of climate change is sea level rise, which I'm sure all of you are aware of. And that puts uh, communities at risk all over the world. So historically, a lot of cities or a lot of great cities in the world are coastal cities for obvious reasons, because that's where you could uh, trade. And so Auckland is an example, as is uh, Wellington, I think. Pretty much every large city in New Zealand uh, is a coastal city, and a lot of great cities uh, all over the world are on the coast. So it's New York, it's Mumbai, it's uh, Singapore, and these are all cities and communities which will ultimately face the brunt of climate change. And that is why we need to recognize that there have to be alternatives to how we design our built environment or our living systems. So. And here, for example, we see a duplication in infrastructure. This again is from uh, a large city somewhere in the South Island. I won't get into specifics, but as you can see, they have, have these different oxidation ponds. They have sludge disposal areas. They have industry effluent treatment ponds. And everybody's building their own distributed infrastructure. Each would come, that comes with its own capital cost, its own operational cost its own land requirements. So this is an inefficient method of treating waste. Whereas if you consolidate this infrastructure, uh, you obviously avoid the duplication of capital costs and your energy recovery and resource recovery to improve. So that's a little bit about uh, what I was speaking to you guys about. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because then we get into uh, a few specifics about our business, which I don't know is particularly relevant to the call today. So I'd love to take some questions now. Awesome. Um, thanks so much. One of the points that you had around um, moving from ownership to stewardship is one one theme that we've heard before in our class. Um, are there any questions? If you're online, feel free to pop it in the chat or even unmute yourself and ask. Uh, maybe raise your hand first. Um, any questions from people here in the room? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, there was a, like a, a like a question that was Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, there was a figure that spoke about New Zealand only using 40% renewables. What was that um, in relation to? Correct. So that's what we, I was speaking to you about, that the belief is that because New Zealand has a significant installed hydropower capacity, that New Zealand's energy use is largely renewable. So first of all, when we refer to energy use, we have to recognize two factors, that there is an energy mix of which electricity is one part of it. There's also gas, there's petroleum, and then there's biomass, right? And even for electricity, while there is a significant amount of installed hydroelectric capacity, the plant utilization factor, which is, uh, it's a simple ratio of how much energy could the plant theoretically produce, to produce and how much does it actually produce. So the ratio of these two numbers gives us what is on the plant utilization factor. In years where rainfall patterns are disturbed or there is less rainfall, 
the amount of water in the hydroelectric reservoirs is reduced. So the hydroelectric plant does not generate energy to its theoretical maximum potential, which means that the plant utilization factor is a lower number in, a, in that given year. Now there is still going to be a demand for energy or electricity. So other electricity generating units need to come on stream. And this is where we see that fossil fuel based energy systems can supply that demand or that load instantaneously because they can be switched on. So that's what the 40% figure for New Zealand's energy use uh, coming from renewables comes about. It does not include the use of petrol and diesel, which is used by uh, the transport sector in New Zealand. It does not include the use of natural gas, which could be either through reticulated pipe gas networks or bottled gas. So which is why to say energy in New Zealand is renewable is, is a misnomer. Good point of we talked so much about New Zealand being um, mostly renewable or having a large percentage of renewable energy, but we, we really just mean renewable electricity. Our electricity comes from those renewable sources and not yes. energy as a whole. Yes. Was there another question? I think you showed us some numbers before, and I might have misheard, but I think you said that was not accounting for New Zealand moving away from like animal-based agriculture. And I was just wondering how likely you thought that was in terms of agriculture. I'm not sure if I misheard any of that. So are you referring to New Zealand moving away from animal-based agriculture towards creating a bioenergy economy? Is that what your question is, is pointed at? Yeah. <laughs> so stories are a great way to understand something, right? And New Zealand was settled largely so that there could be access to bioenergy. And think about it. It was the premier, most important whaling destination in the world for a couple of centuries. And before mankind discovered fossil fuel, animal fat was what was used as the primary source of energy and wood. And humans discovered that you could slaughter a whale and remove its fat. And one whale would give you several tons of it. And so that's what led to you know, the colonization of New Zealand by European settlers. And ultimately, it was uh, the British who managed to make it one of their colonies. But this was for access to whaling seas in order to have access to energy. And the primary industry in New Zealand has always been the spine or the backbone of the economy. It remains so even today, but it has evolved and we've had at different times over the genesis of New Zealand's uh, evolution as a country and as an economy, there has been a focus on felt or skins, there has been a focus on wool, there a focus on meat, and currently there's a focus on dairy, right? So even within agriculture and even within the primary industry, there has been some degree of, of, of natural cycle basis what has been largely in demand. But if you begin to recognize that agriculture as it is in New Zealand today is extractive and not sustainable because New Zealand needs to import all this fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, to New Zealand to grow pasture, 
to feed cows, but produce milk, which is then dried into milk solids using coal, and which is then exported to other countries. It's not a sustainable model, either in terms of water or land use in New Zealand currently. And New Zealand in turn imports large amounts of petroleum for its energy requirements. But again, since there has traditionally been such a strong and well-developed primary industry in New Zealand, the same industry can pivot from animal or livestock-based farming towards creating a more bioenergy, uh, <clears throat> an economy that recognizes the potential of bioenergy. So that is the argument to be made. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, are there any other questions for people in the room or on Zoom? Um, I was curious, when you talk about bioenergy, are you talking about like wood products that we turn into energy or something else? And if you're talking about wood products, how does that link in with New Zealand's agenda to try and create more permanent forests as carbon sinks? Again, excellent question. So maybe I should explain it a little better. Bioenergy or biofuels can be of three types. So those are solid, liquid, and gaseous biofuels, depending on their physical state. Solid biofuels, quite obviously, is uh, referring to wood. And plant industry is uh, a sustainable way of utilizing wood. Of course, it stands to reason that you cannot grow trees as fast as you can cut them down and burn them. <clears throat> so that then begs the question, what are the alternatives for biofuels? And there are some clues here, both in the use of liquid and ga gaseous biofuels. As a business today, our focus is on gaseous biofuels because, as we know, any organic matter will decompose and produce gas, primarily methane. And this methane is a fuel source that can actually be harvested and used uh, for energy. But even in New Zealand, there are significant feed stocks available to produce liquid biofuels, primarily biodiesel and uh, bioethanol, which are drop-in fuels, which means that they can be substituted directly in existing systems. And you can use ethanol in place of petrol, and you can use biodiesel in <coughs> substitute. And these can be grown and produced from a variety of plant feedstocks. And they can be grown utilizing the nutrients that we have in our bio waste. And that's when we begin to see the potential to utilize human bio waste to grow fuel crop and avoid the need to use fossil fuels. Are there any final questions from anyone um, on Zoom or in person? Um, I I did wonder. Um, so, is your your company is looking to implement these the circular economy or circular um, system, and and I guess one how you go about doing that, or are you already trying to do that, like in a in a certain region or, or yeah, how does, how does what you talked about relate to what your company is doing? So for the New Zealand market, our focus is on two specific areas. One is to provide treatment systems to local councils. And here it is about organic waste. So our first plant, or our technology demonstrator, as we call it, is on the South Island, which will be processing sewage sludge from the wastewater treatment plant, along with grape mark, 
which is essentially the leftover product once you crush this to the swine. So it will be a co-digestion facility for this these two waste feedstocks. For, uh, the sludge ends up going to landfill and the grape mark otherwise is spread over the land because the nature begins to impact soil quality. So a proper disposal mechanism for these waste byproducts is needed. So that's our technology that we need. We're currently responding to an RFI for another council where, and this is the one that's really exciting, right? It's, it's going to be approximately 400 tons per day of include sludge from a wastewater treatment plant. It will include all the green waste and grounds collected by the council. And it will also include waste from a meat works uh, a few kilometers away, which includes blood and uh, paunch litter. So blood obviously is, is self-explanatory. It's the blood of the animal that has been slaughtered. Paunch liquor is all the undigested or partially digested food within the digestive tract of the animal. And this is all waste that otherwise ends up in landfill. So once it ends up in landfill, it emits greenhouse gases as it decomposes, and it also leaches into the groundwater. So by utilizing the process that we do, we can recover energy from these wastes utilize this energy to supply the wastewater treatment plant, for example, thereby reducing the energy need of that wastewater treatment plant and produce a product which can then be used as a fertilizer, which in turn substitutes an equivalent portion of chemical-based fertilizer. So that's one business case. The other is focused at a meatworks, which is one of the largest in New Zealand, and which has a large process heat requirement, which is currently supplied by coal. And by waste available locally. So not just the waste from that one, but also waste from the neighboring areas, such as crop residues, which otherwise have no utility once the crop is harvested. So farmers tend to burn the standing stalks in the field because it's the quickest the cheapest way to clear the farm. So utilizing the crop residues along with the slaughterhouse waste to produce biogas again, which in turn will substitute the use of coal at that meat works. So these are examples of the work that we're doing in New Zealand. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any final questions for no, thank you. Um, thanks for joining us, especially when it's probably a bit early for you. Um, it was great to hear about kind of those concepts and what you all are doing to, to address them. It's, it's been wonderful speaking to all of you as well. And uh, Lauren, you have uh, my email address and Matthew's email address. So please feel free to share it with the class. If anybody has any questions, then We'd be happy to engage with them and uh, do follow elementary systems on LinkedIn. <laughs> that's that's where we have some sort of a public profile currently. So awesome. Yeah, yeah. If anyone um, realizes that they have further questions, I've got um, contact information and stuff like that. Um, cool. Thanks so much. It was great to meet you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, class. It's been nice speaking to all of you. See you. See ya. All right. Um, for everyone on Zoom and here, I do have a few things before we leave. Uh, I'll keep it recording for anyone who watches this. Um, we can just, I was just going to look at the schedule um, and see if anyone had any questions and go over a couple things. Cool. So we're halfway done. That's pretty exciting. Um, how's everyone doing? I know I get really tired by the end of this. Yeah. Um, tomorrow we've got uh, a day, like most kind of a typical day. Um, 
Judy will talk to us and then Rich will talk to us. He, I, I hope this will be really cool. Uh, Rich has this big, he's leading this big sea level rise program in New Zealand. Um, and so kind of touching on this, he's a scientist, so touching on the sea level bits that we've heard about, but the project is much more interdisciplinary. So hopefully, hopefully he'll cover those bits too. Um, like I said, on Friday, we won't have anything. I'll be in here maybe around 11. Um, uh, if anyone wants to ask questions about their essay or their project or really anything in general. Um, and then I guess the one other thing I wanted to point out that we haven't talked about yet is on Monday, we don't have a tutorial, but we'll have this time for essay peer review. Um, so you won't be marked for anything. You don't have to have anything ready for your essay by that time, but if you do, you'll get more out of it. So if you, if you're able to put together maybe a more detailed outline than you have already, um, in the past, we've kind of found people who maybe have a, a full draft and put them together as partners, people who maybe have an outline and people who kind of haven't worked on it much since the initial project idea was due. Um, so the more you have done, the more you can work with one or two other people and read each other's and get some feedback. And I will go around the room and also um, skim through stuff and chat about ideas. So. It's just a chance, kind of a blocked off set of time to work on that. And we'll do the same with people who are around on Zoom, put you in maybe breakout rooms so that you can, uh, I guess, share and then read through each other's essays that you have so far. Um, are there any questions? Oh yeah, uh, does anyone who attended the lecture have a problem if there's no quiz? Nah, cool. Yeah, so no, there won't be any quiz for this lecture. Um, <laughs> neat. Uh, any questions for anyone on Zoom? Nah, I'll stop, stop sharing and stop recording now then. Um,